Hey you guys, so welcome back to my channel and as promised in the description of my last video, I want to do a follow up to the story time about the project from hell. So this one is going to be about what I actually learned thanks to the project from hell and I consider these things to be maybe self-evident to some people, probably sure why not, but to me they weren't necessarily self-evident so i would love to just list off the things in a somewhat concise way as much as i can manage i guess to just let you guys know what the the most crucial takeaways were for me from the um the horrible experience that i spoke about so i'm just gonna go in order of sort of in the order that i mentioned them in my previous video if you haven't seen it please just take a look and this will probably have a lot more context, but if not, it'll still most likely be informative regardless. Obviously, I'm talking about an art-related project that should go without saying. But yeah, so the first thing that I spoke about in the previous video was communication. And I know I was pretty vague about it, but uh, I mean, I just pretty much said that it was crappy communication all around, which is accurate. And mostly I think there was just lack of communication and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about that. So one of the issues that I personally had that I obviously learned <laughs> um, not to do afterwards was I was too candid with the writer. So she was the person who was who brought me onto the project and technically we did not know each other beforehand and so our relationship was formed on a purely professional basis but i did not really understand that i didn't understand the full implications of that at the beginning stages so i was kind of failing to keep the communication professional and i'm not just gonna say that for myself i think it goes the same for the writer and i don't think this is like a wrong thing or a weird thing it just it doesn't bode well for when you work together with a person especially in the case when differences regarding the work or the project that you're working on arise so that's exactly what happened with us like we because we formed like a sort of friendship that was super casual and candid and we spoke to each other all the time so we had a very friend like communication style it was really weird and unnatural to switch to a more professional concise type of communication when it came to solving problems which is why i believe we actually couldn't solve the big problem of the difference of opinion and the clash that we came to at some point i think it's natural to have differences of opinion but i just think it's important to keep in mind the nature of your relationship and maybe wait for like several months and wait for some problems to arrive to arise and to actually have solved them properly without any major issues until you decide to make the friendship or like make your relationship with the person you're working with a little more candid or casual i guess or maybe just don't do that at all i mean it's obviously it should be based on a case-to-case -case basis but um yeah, in my experience, it was kind of a mistake to make it too much of a casual friendship type of situation from the beginning. So yeah, there's that. And then um, like directly related to that is be very aware of your job description, like what you're supposed to be doing on the project and what your areas of expertise are on i suppose because that's another thing that can sometimes get really convoluted with a disagreement so if there's a disagreement that cannot be put out with just conversation like at some point you might have to just pull your job description card which is a last resort but i do think that at the beginning of any project people should be keenly aware of what their actual job is supposed to be at the end of the day and you can't choose a hill to die on that is not even part of your job description. So there's that. That's a very important thing to keep in mind. Like, uh, just just make sure that you don't overstep your 
like invisible boundaries on a project and if you think that something like if you think you're right about something but the person you're talking to or disagreeing with isn't but it's it falls under their job description you just have to let it go because that's that's the best way of solving these things and that's all i'm gonna say about that so yes and the last thing about the communication so the biggest different uh, the biggest mistake that i made was relying too much on communicating with the writer because we were working so closely together and we spoke all the time since the very start of well since the start of when i was brought onto the project i completely it like completely went over my head that i can and should communicate regularly with the rest of the team as well or at least try to like i don't know if that would have made any difference in the long run because i mean s subsequent communications even though sporadically some problems were solved as a result of communicating with the rest of the team or like the people that were in charge technically of making sure that the project is running smoothly i guess the best thing i can say for stuff like that is don't wait for them to check out on you don't wait for them to like ask you if if, if everything is going well or if you need any like uh, you know assistance on how to go about something as soon as you have any sort of question in your mind at all you should just contact them right away and just see what they say that is way better than waiting and stewing on like in this weird place of unknowing because that's kind of what we ended up doing a lot me and the writer like we were wondering about some things but for some reason that is now completely uh unknowable to me i we did not uh, raise our concerns with the publisher until like way later until it was pretty much just pointless to even bring things up so yeah i would say as soon as you have any sort of question just talk to your um co-workers or your superiors on a project or whatever and just ask them there's no harm in that whatsoever don't think that it's gonna make you look like you don't know what you're doing or anything like that because yeah, if you're not sure, then you probably don't know what you're doing and you're only going to find out by asking someone who does, presumably. So just do it and no one's going to think any less of you. And it's way better to take care of things like that as soon as they come up rather than to just sit on them and wait until, like, wait to see what happens. So yeah, communication is super important. Just be polite, be clear, and don't be too shy. <laughs> Okay, so the next point I want to talk about is regarding feedback. So I'm going to say that one of my biggest takeaways was that I'm very glad that I heavily, heavily relied on my own judgment. So that's that would be my best piece of advice. Rely on your judgment and you should look at your work critically so one of the things that i think personally probably saved my saved me from a lot of like maybe redos or adjustments is that i knew that like one of the biggest things was that there was a lack of feedback and like nobody was really saying anything nobody was reviewing the work but i took it seriously enough that i went over it thoroughly myself and saw if i could like catch as many things as i can and just basically do do my best so that I will catch most of the mistakes myself and honestly that really paid off because at the end of the day after all the artwork was done I only got a couple of notes that I didn't catch on like a couple of just like minor continuity mistakes but aside from that I guess when it comes to specifically in this context working on a graphic novel your number one priority should always be clarity and that was obviously something that I was very very concerned about so even at the thumbnail stage I always just really obsessed over whether something is clear or not as to what's happening or like facial expressions obviously to the best of my ability like I'm not gonna claim that everything is perfect but it's good to just you know be your own editor be your own person who gives yourself feedback if that makes any sense because you can't always rely on other people to come through in a timely manner and it's best to just like at least do the best that you can while you're doing it 
on your own. And on a more technical note, before you start working on a project, make sure that you have a no post hoc endless feedback clause. So what I mean by that is a very common freelance issue that uh, us artists or probably a lot of other people in other professions run into as well is when they're begins to be a cycle of endless adjustments so when the client doesn't 100 percent know what they want it's easier for them to see what they don't want and thus they will continue to ask you to change little things and it can get quite absurd i mean i'm not um specifically talking about this project thankfully but i have had experiences in the past where a client will just keep wanting little minor changes and uh, at that point, I did not take that into account. And it's something I guess you just have to learn from um, experience. So now going forward with any client, I always have a maybe like a very small amount of minor adjustments that come in with the price of the work. But anything more than that or anything past like the finish stage, uh, has to be completed at an extra hourly charge so that actually makes life easier for everybody the client included because sometimes the client just doesn't really understand that they're, they're wasting a lot of time and they they don't have respect for your time so if you put a price tag on it they will take your time more seriously obviously because every time they want something changed post hoc they will have to pay for it and that generally makes the process a lot more e efficient and they usually like figure their they're forced to figure their things out in the actual process of the project and not after it has been completed so yeah make sure that you have you do some reasonable amount of adjustments in the process but you charge extra for any adjustments that you um, that the client wants you to make after the finished product so the next point i want to talk about is doing some math okay this is one of the most important things that i took away from this project because here's the thing it's very easy to estimate how long it'll take to do a one-off illustration or even a series of a few illustrations but it's an entirely different ball game when you're trying to estimate such a lengthy and gigantic project as a graphic novel so I just wanted to quickly mention that one of the most important things that you should do is heavily pad your estimation. Like add 40% extra time to what you estimated just to account for anything that you don't that you can't predict because obviously when you're expected to work on something for like over the course of a year or longer uh, in my case, it was around two years or even more than that. There's so many things that can happen in two years that you cannot predict, like moving for whatever reason or just like personal things, just, just any number of things can happen. So you have to have to pad the time estimate. And you know what? I'm going to go on a little tangent here and say that I think it's really, really strange that in my contract for this graphic novel, it was not a page rate. It should always be a page rate. Uh, for some reason, I had like this weird bulk sum that made no sense. And I mean, I did divide it by the pages and the rate was abysmal and I knew that. So there's obviously nobody to blame, but uh, it wasn't described as a page rate in a contract. It was just like, illustrator agrees to receive x sum for whatever amount of work and this this included like the cover and any other work that was involved in designing like whatever elements of the book so that was weird and it should not have happened and i actually know that okay this is another thing check the contract like i know that sometimes these contracts can be super long and I made the mistake of only reading it once. It was like 30 pages. So, I mean, I don't blame myself. And I personally have a really hard time getting through long and dry text documents like that. And you know what? I had an agent. 
okay? And it was the agent's job to go through that document on my behalf and catch anything. And maybe she did catch some things, I don't know. But she completely failed to do her job because I noticed like way later that the contract was written up for a black and white graphic novel. And that is insane. And you know what? That would actually explain why the pay was so low like so absurdly low because they just didn't even take into account the fact that it was going to be pretty much a full color graphic novel like i understand that it's kind of monochromatic like it can be described as monochromatic but the level of rendering and the level the amount of work that it took regardless to make it look the way that it did especially considering like some later chapters pretty much look like they're in full color anyways um yeah it was it, it should have been paid as a full color graphic novel but it was not so there's that and i i don't know why the agent didn't notice this or didn't think that this was significant i was told that um i'm actually getting a really good rate and all that so that's another thing i wanted to really really warn you guys about do not listen to promises of exposure. I'm sure many of you guys have uh, have heard a lot about like, do not work for exposure. You always have to get paid. But you know what? Sometimes it's a combination of both. Sometimes you will get... Well, I mean, essentially what an advance is when you work with a publisher, that is promise of <laughs> exposure or whatever it is like it's an advance against royalties so basically you're supposed to be able to make money off of royalties off of a book that sells right like however many copies sell you should be able to get a certain percentage of that and what an advance is you're not actually getting paid for your work you're getting paid the hypothetical royalties that will come from after the publication of the book and once those royalties have been covered like once the advance amount has been accrued by the royalties that you make presumably after the book comes out that's when you actually start getting royalties which by the way i have not gotten any royalties and i do not understand how a project can do relatively well upon release and then get picked up by two other foreign publishers and get uh translated and etc and still not see any royalties from that which makes it makes no sense like i don't know if maybe somebody can explain that to me but to me that that's absurd like it's absurd for a book to be popular enough to get translated into a couple of different languages and still accrue no money whatsoever for the creators I, I don't know what's going on there but the point is when you have a situation where whoever the person is trying to sell you on the project is telling you that oh i know it might seem like a low rate but actually this is normal in the industry and you know what you're getting a much higher rate than a person of your ex with your experience uh, would have gotten typically so this is actually really good and like you should take it you know and it'll be so great to be published and you will get so many jobs and all this other shit so that's like just it's people can say whatever they want and you know it may or may not be true but it's in your best interest to ignore the promises of exposure and just approach it in a level-headed way where you have to make sure that first of all the contract is accurate and then you have to make sure that it's a project that you'd be happy working on even if you don't get a shit ton of exposure or if you don't get royalties like you have to i think understand that none of these things are guarantees and you have to really really picture the worst case scenario just to be familiar with it mentally the worst case scenario for something like this being the project flops you never see any royalties nobody hears about it it sells a some copies but it gets forgotten which is like not that far off from what happened with this project for me and maybe i was putting out negative vibes into the universe i don't know but i was ready for this i did not hold my breath because even though for the while mostly while i was working on it i had i wouldn't go as far as to say it, i had high hopes but i was working really hard on trying to make it as good as i possibly can and I wholeheartedly believed that that would be worth something and that that alone will be enough to, you know, somehow make this 
project stand out or something. I don't know. I, I That's what I thought. But after some time and after I finished the artwork, when there was this long gap of nothing um, and just sporadic, like small communications in between months and months, I realized that the level of genuine concern that I had with this project was obviously much much higher than anybody else involved excluding the writer obviously she's the only other person who cared a lot about how this book was gonna do but it just wasn't the case for the rest of the people involved for whatever reason um they might have been going through some sort of internal overhaul i do think that they were moving offices or something i don't know there were things going on behind the scenes that i wasn't aware of but the takeaway there is just it's best to be aware of what the worst case scenario would be for your involvement with a project and make sure that if that's what happens, you will be okay with it, you know? And I think to some extent, I did go through that in my head before I started working on it because I kind of sold myself on the fact that regardless of what happens, this will be a lot of experience for me personally in in as in like i will learn how to efficiently work on a graphic novel of a magnitude and i will learn how to create a pipeline for myself and like all these other other things which is true it, all those things i did and i think that's why i mean it was still horrible obviously dealing with the aftermath and it, the way that it went down was a lot worse than i expected <laughs> in many ways but in some ways it was kind of what i thought would happen and that's fine so yeah i guess that's a really really long way of saying like you have to make sure that you familiarize yourself with the worst case scenario and that will not break you like mentally you know if the worst happens to the project or whatever yeah and um back to the math so this whole this whole point was me telling you guys that it's really really important to do some math when you're involving yourself in a large project and learn how to really be able to accurately quote the hours or like the time to assess the time that'll take you to uh, do each page or whatever and then pad it heavily and also include vacation time and like random time off and just just pass pad it by like 40 percent even 50 percent and then divide whatever amount of days you get by what you're going to get paid and then based on that decide whether it's actually a livable wage make sure that it's a livable wage that's the most important thing because in my case it absolutely was not a livable wage it was really really low and it was not enough to even cover like monthly rent and i didn't even live alone like it was half of my rent and so yeah just enough said there's there's nothing else there so yeah moving on so working with other people uh i just want to circle back to that like one of the biggest things that i learned is to just obviously know your role like that's important and it was important for me because i i know myself and i know that i i'm a little like i consider myself slightly multidisciplinary so like i'm not just i don't like to pigeon pigeonhole myself into one thing so because i'm I, I tend to do research into other things and i'm somewhat familiar with other areas of um I don't know, like other parts of projects like this. I do value my own opinion, but I know that I could potentially overstep my professional boundaries when it comes to what my actual uh, job description, like what my actual job description entails. So I will sometimes express something, but I will pull back as soon as it's not meant with enthusiasm, if you know what I mean. So there's that, and I, I think that's how other people should probably carry themselves as well. <laughs> Unless their job description is to fix everybody else and tell everyone else what to do. So anyway, so yeah, the next thing, I've already, already talked about that, so there's no point in reiterating. The next thing I wanted to talk about is really adjusting your expectations. So I kind of touched on that before, but I think the less 
expectations you have going into a project, the easier it will be on your mental health. So this also kind of goes back to mentally familiarizing yourself with the worst case scenario and just knowing, at least having some sort of strategy in mind in terms of how to dealing with it, like how to deal with it. But yeah, I mean, conflicts with other people are, they're kind of inevitable when you're working on something. So it's best to not expect too much. And the best you can hope for is professional courtesy and to just keep that in mind i know that this point is kind of like kind of vague and i don't really know how else to uh, put that but that takes me straight to adjusting your level of personal commitment i think that's that's a more accurate way of putting it probably so from my personal experience going into this project i was over committed to it and in some ways it had to be that way because it was pretty much my full-time job for about two years, I would say. And so in a situation like that, when you're working on something all the time, every day, of course, you have to feel committed to it. Otherwise, you will feel like you're wasting your time. On the same hand, like putting too much personal commitment into a project that's not just your own and in which there are a lot of other people involved, it's, it can kind of backfire a little bit. So, I mean, if I were like, when I go into projects from now on, I make it very clear to myself that this is not my baby. Like this is somebody else's baby. I'm just babysitting. And obviously there are minimum things that I have to do to complete this job. I have to do it well, etc. But at the end of my day, it's not my baby. So that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind, I think, for personal sanity. At least for me, that's always been kind of like a recurring thing in my life. Like when I get involved, this is one of the biggest reasons why I don't like working in groups of people. Uh, I Sometimes partnerships are fine, whatever, like working with a couple of other people, as long as everybody is keenly aware of the roles, it's, it's fine. I've had a great time working with other people before with client work, but when it comes to group projects, especially when the stakes are low, like I'm talking about like freaking school group projects. I'm sure all of you guys probably have a couple of horrible experiences with things like that. But the reason why experiences like that are horrible oftentimes is because they try to simulate this work-like environment in a school. And you know what? I suppose it's not even that different at actual work because it, it's about the level of stakes, you guys. Like people have... Like when the stakes are high for you personally, you're gonna try your best to do as much as you can to make the project the best thing that it can be. But it's not going to be like that for everyone, just by default. Like the world would be a crazy place if everybody took their jobs that seriously. Maybe it would be a better place, maybe not, you know, who knows? But the reality of the situation is that it's not going to be the same for everyone. And that's usually, what causes friction in situations like that and so i think it's very smart to adjust your level of commitment um in direct relation to what the project you're involved with is so just remind yourself to treat it like a job which is what it is you know what i mean and maybe that's super self-evident to some people but you know it wasn't to me like to me i had to get burned on that one several times before i finally learned that some things you just gotta let it go and like and just because you don't care like you have to tell yourself that you just don't care at a certain point about where something is going if you think it's going in the wrong direction it's just it's not your problem uh it's not like you're you don't have to fix everything and you don't you're not even necessarily right about your opinion on where things are going whether it's wrong or right so yeah it's it's important to have a healthy level of detachment from a job that you take on and will be over at some point <laughs> so yeah so that takes me to the next point which is knowing your self-worth and knowing what your time is worth uh i'm sure i've spoken about this before and it is pretty straightforward but yeah like that that was honestly one of the biggest things that i took away from this project is 
I didn't value my time enough and I didn't value my contribution enough because if I did, I would have done the proper math and I would have said no to this project because it simply just didn't pay enough. Everything else about it was fine. It, it just, the pay was just too low. And sometimes it, 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 even if you feel like you might like working on something, if the pay is not a livable wage, you should just say no. Because when you take on something like that, it, it creates a situation that might result in so many problems and it'll just, it'll just reinforce the devaluing of yourself and you don't want to do that so that's important i i don't know what what else to really say about that specific thing but yeah you should you should know what your time is worth and you should never work for less than a livable wage but you know in an ideal world it would be way more than a simply livable wage what you should aim for is a comfortable life the type of life that does that, that allows you to exist stress-free where you don't have to live from paycheck to paycheck that's that's the goal to aim for for everybody i think and um yeah so the next point is about uh staying true to yourself and not betraying yourself okay so this is i can talk about this for a while and but i just want to make it concise because this video is getting a little bit long at this point but the point that i'm trying to make with the statement do not betray yourself is to be keenly aware of the promises that you make to yourself and to make sure that you don't you don't fail to deliver on those promises that you make to yourself like in this particular case specifically I set a certain standard for what I wanted the artwork to look like and short like not that long into the project I noticed that it you know it was paying abysmally it was taking too long I had no help like I'll be yada 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 but like it was really important for me not to betray myself when it comes to quality so I regardless of all the circumstances I understood that I signed up for this and I have to stay true to the, the things that i set out to do in my head and that was one of the major things that i set out to do at the beginning of the project it was the quality of the art that i wanted to deliver was very important to me and i managed to pretty much stick with it and i think like literally the last chapter is when my mind was just my body and my mind was just giving out <laughs> so i kind of like started slipping then but i don't even know if it's, it would be that noticeable to you guys it, it was a little bit to me but not as badly as you know i thought it would turn out but anyways the point is like at the end of the day even after all that even after like the horrible pay and the flop and like all that other crap that transpired afterwards I can still like that's the one thing that's always great every time i open the book and i flip through it i always feel a sense of accomplishment that i didn't betray myself when it comes to quality even though i was told by a ton of people to just take it easy and just like just get it done like stop caring about all this the, all the little details and just whatever like quality be damned like you just have to finish which i totally understand why people would say that and it, it does sound like a sensible thing to do but i'm really glad that i didn't listen and i just just kept to the quality because now it's one of the it's one of my biggest personal accomplishments that came out of this graphic novel so yeah and moving on the last thing i wanted to talk about real quick is just mentally cutting your losses and moving on as soon as your project is done like as soon as you're done you just like just forget about it um i know that that sounds kind of weird but the point here is that you shouldn't rely on the success of a project to give you a sense of accomplishment your accomplishment has to come from somewhere else because you cannot predict how successful something is going to be you just can't like it has there's a million factors and luck is one of them uh and as much as you can do your best and work really hard it's a mistake to believe that hard work alone will 
guarantee the success of a project because that's just not how things work. So to in order to protect yourself from the mental fallout of a failure of a project, you have to take pride in your work and your work alone, regardless of how successful it is. So it's it's more personal than that. I think that's really important. And um, I guess I don't really have too much more to say about that. But yeah, it's just kind of focus on making sure that your work speaks for itself to you when you look at it and you feel like you did the best you can and you can really take pride in the work that you did and whatever happens after it's out it just whatever happens happens if it's good great if it's not that's fine you have already mentally moved on (laughs) that's that's the point that i was trying to make with that and lastly just on a personal note one of my biggest things that was very very difficult but i i was adamant on not being stuck in the victimhood role because my mind did fall into that place many many times like a million times while i was working on this project it's super easy to feel mistreated to feel like no one gives a shit to feel like you're being abused and to feel like you're just like a slave to this shitty contract that you signed voluntarily (laughs) is what i've pretty much kept telling myself but yeah so the point is it's important not to allow yourself to feel like a victim too much because at the end of the day like i just i just had to accept that i made some mistakes and that people aren't necessarily always going to care about my circumstances and that's fine and all i had to do was to make sure that I will be the person to always care about my circumstances going forward. And the future is bright, man. Like, it is what you make it. So, another personal note there. I learned that how how you feel is, is a direct manifestation of what's going on deep inside your soul. So, if you have imposter syndrome, that's a self-worth issue. And if you have, if you're accepting bad pays, that's also a self-worth issue. It's all inside your head. So I, I, I do think that the most important point that I learned is to always, always put mental health first because it will literally make or break the rest of your life, whether you're aware of it or not. So you're you might as well just consciously be aware of where your mental health is at and to improve it and to kind of be aware and check in with yourself a lot and to give yourself breaks and not to overwork yourself and to just treat yourself like a decent human being that deserves you know whatever it is like the very basic things that everyone does you know I don't want to like go on a spiel about self-love and all this because that's a little bit besides the point but you know that's pretty much uh where it ended up going anyways at the end of the day so yeah I know that I might have worded some things weirdly and I want you guys to know that I don't think I'm an expert on any any of these things like obviously I know that I, I know that I'm probably not the easiest person to work with I, I've been I've, I think I've made a lot of progress on that front I think after having adjusted the way that I look at things the way that I approach projects especially group projects or you know like being involved with a large team of people I think the things that I spoke about in this video really really helped me in being much better at it and you know, my career has been going a lot better after I finished. So I really hope that some of these things will help you guys. And uh, yeah, that's that's the best I can hope for. So thank you so much for listening to this video. And if you have any questions for me that you'd like me to answer and uh, in future videos, please don't hesitate to leave a comment. And yes, so I'll see you guys in my next one. Bye.